Hello. Namaskara, Mysuru. I'm pleased, honored, thrilled to be here, particularly to be sharing a stage with such an eminent personality as Dr. Balu. Um, I'm sure Dr. Balu has much to share with us. I know I have more questions than can reasonably fit in 45 minutes. So we're going to try and adhere strictly to time. Without further ado, I'm going to request Dr. Balu to contextualize for us the work that he's currently doing, because the scope is quite large and the vision is immense. And then from there, we'll open into some conversation and then dialogue with the floor with all of you. So if you have questions, may I suggest you jot them down. Um, if you do this on your phone, please keep your phone on silent. And, uh, and I look forward to the conversation. Over to you with no further ado. Thank you, Muna. First of all, I need to thank my Literature Society, all the trustees, Shubha, and everybody else for having me here. And it's always a privilege to come back to your hometown, especially for something like a literature festival. Uh, the topic, if you were to dive into it right away, embedding state capacity with community wisdom, I think involves a lot of deconstruction. One is embedding. Who are we to embed? Second is what do we understand by nation or the state and its capacity? And the third is why community wisdom? Are community people even wise enough? Because normally the governments believe that citizens are recipients of welfare. And if you look at our own country, today we are celebrating 75 years of independence. Uh, Amrit Kal uh, and Amrit Mahotsav is starting August 15th. We're just about entering into it. So I think it's a great topic in my view to sit back and reflect and pause and ask ourselves uh, what is our role and how do we embed. So I just want to walk you down 75 years first. You know, when we got our freedom in 47, 350 million people, less than 2% of the world's GDP was ours. Um, something like, you know, if for, if we, were, we were so poor that if you lived 40 years, you would actually exceed the, the national average of uh, longevity. Uh, for a country which for 1,600 years controlled 38% of global GDP, to be at that state itself is a question we need to ask ourselves, how did we allow this to happen? It's very easy to blame colonization and all that, but something deeper. But the point I'm trying to make is at such a point of time, we inherited uh, the Indian civil service, if you can call that as a state capacity. And there's a very famous uh, uh, quote, not mine definitely, Somebody who said the ICS actually is not the Indian civil service. There's neither nothing Indian about it, ni neither is it civil, nor is it actually serving. Now, I'm not even commenting on that. But the reality is, when we inherited them, remember, we were all subjects of a benign crown before independence. And suddenly, we are called citizens. And it makes a huge mind shift in people responding to us. So we were always seen as people who were to be controlled. Now, I, I, when I started this organization, I had this very basic doubt. When I was 19 and Swami Vivek and the youth movement, somebody told me, you need seven people to register it. And I was wondering, how did the government arrive at the number seven? I, I, and it took me one year of working in government to figure it out. The act is under 1860. We have inherited a British act, and some British officer realized that if seven Indians get together, it's a problem. They could overthrow the country, or the government. And so they said, we need to know if seven Indians are getting together anywhere. And therefore, the Society's Registration Act, the minimum number became seven. And we are still following it. And, and, and it's all strange. But then we, nobody's asked these questions. This government has at least waved off close to 1,800 obsolete laws like that. And hopefully, they'll retouch this law soon. But the point I'm trying to make is we inherited a country where we are, the system were to control and regulate us, they were to prevent us from coming together and talking of participation in the state. And so there's no wisdom they were looking for. In fact, they were worried about the, what they call the native wisdom. And the people were trained to provide. So we were a provider nation. You had to give right from making. How many of you have eaten modern bread before it got sold to the liver? Right? I remember when we fall sick, my mother would say, go, they should never say go buy bread. Modern bread to go Budu. That is how we were all told. Right? And we grew up on that. Fever meant, I don't know why, they thought it was like parastamol. Today, like Dolo 650, modern bread was, you fall sick, <laughs> go bring it. No, but from running airports to uh, ports, everything the state did for citizens. Citizens had no role. You took what was given to you. When my father bought his first Bajaj scooter, he waited 11 years to get it allotted. Not because India didn't have the capacity to make it, but because the state told Bajaj, you cannot make more than one scooter more than what I allow you to make. 
we lived in a situation where the state told us how to live our lives. Because that is how we, that's the bureaucracy we inherited. It's very easy for them. But 90s when we privatized, when we globalized, and we decided to so-called trickle down. I don't know how much of it has trickled down, but at least we shifted focus. Suddenly the bureaucrats who were trained to regulate, who were trained to pro provide to citizens, which it was necessary at A47, suddenly had to facilitate, had to stop regulating, had to suddenly allow private sector to grow. And they had no skills for that. And today the Honorable PM talks of Jan Bagidari. And figuring it out itself will take a long time for people. When he says Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, people think it's a slogan. People think, when he says Sabka Prayas, he says all of you are part of Team India to build a new India. And that is why I felt, you know, if citizen engagement matters so much, and we have been invited to participate, are we doing our jobs? Are we actually using this opportunity and engaging in the system? Because it's very easy to criticize, and I've seen this, I've been an activist. I've gone on protest, I've sat in on, Mysore has known me for my protest, I would sit on the road and say, the road is not laid properly, the Dasara, a lot of money is getting wasted. All that we have done. I can give you one, ex one example. When I was protesting uh, for that Dasara uh, route, and, uh, and uh, somebody, uh, I, I, I was standing in the middle of the road and said, this, this, this road that they are making is not up to the uh, sanctioned, the, as per the blueprint of the sanction or whatever. And the city corporation is paying much more than what the road is uh, to be legitimately spent on. They are just black painting the road, not laying it. So I sat in the middle of the road with a hammer and a screwdriver. I still remember the photograph in Star of Mysore. And they broke it open and it was less than quarter inch. And, and the estimate was for two inches of resurfacing. So I said, until the corporation commissioner comes and explains to me why two inches becomes half inch, what mathematics is it, I'm not getting up. So nice noise, and we activists always have the media around us. So a lot of things came up, next day it came up. Next morning, 8 o'clock, I get a call from a so-called engaged citizen. And he said, sir, yen, sir, and I'm in my own house. If it's somebody worries about my not being at home, my wife should worry. <laughs> and this guy said, what are you doing? I said, yeka, yen, I this actually happened and I was, I was astonished. I told him, how the entrant I to, nashta I to nimdu I He said, aglila, maadbedi nanda I said. Maybe the irony was lost on him. But the point I'm trying to make is, uh, and, and it, I can, the conversation went on. I said, yatik ni wok prishne kerala. Chana gheel tira sir, nano godus ko beka ratra, contract ratra. So he's very comfortable and convenient, I getting beaten up. <laughs> you know? And for a citizen engagement is the opportunity to complain. But community wisdom is something else. And I want to just narrate one story and then I'll want you not to take over from there. 87, I still remember, fresh into this tribal area, desperately seeking affirmation. Somebody would recognize me as a doctor and say, oh no, India's Albert Schweizer one bit dare. And tribals on to, they thought this fellow has not passed his medicine. So, as usual, the skepticism which we see. We, we are all so fatigued with all the skepticism that we don't see it as a joyous change happening. I can tell you, despite all the noise outside, despite all this, this newspapers, I, I, the best prescription I can give you as a doctor if you want to maintain mental health is shut off the televisions. Don't read the newspapers. It's a sad part, but my job is now to read them, but I, I, that's a state of affairs. It, it sort of, it, it just drains you off. And I was looking for acceptance, and I would tra travel around in an old jeep the Mysore Ramakrishna Ashram had given me, and hoping that somebody somewhere I can meet them and say, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor. I wanted people to fall sick. You know, we doctors are very intelligent. We don't keep you healthy. We want you sick. Right? That's the way we operate, and that's how our relevance comes. If, we keep, if you're healthy, then where is my relevance? So I was looking for disease everywhere, and I saw eight or ten tribal women in a place called uh, B. Matkere in um, Shrikote, sitting. Our current is Lila. So they were all sitting around and talking. After 6.37, they're just talking, they finish their dinner, they're going to go sleep. I thought, oh, captive audience. I descended on them and told them, you know what, I'm a doctor, I'm in Brahmagiri. Anybody's got a problem, you should come to me. I didn't know the better Kurba language enough to understand what they were saying. And I saw that older lady tell the one of the younger ones, Hala Dor, you rogalan satte, yargo sharilan theer budden, marbutotakare. 
she was keen on getting rid of me. And I thought, okay, let me do something. And finally, they remembered that uh, one of the women, women, younger woman there, her daughter had diarrhea. She's a six-month-old baby. So she said, go bring it and show it to this guy. Hopefully, he'll go away. So they brought it, and then there I was, waiting for this opportunity. And I downloaded what was, what was thought to me as Western global north wisdom, the discovery of the century, oral rehydration. You know, go get the water, boil it, cool it, one liter of it, throw your, uh, you know, a handful of sugar into it, two pinches of salt, all this stuff. I, with all my Elan, downloaded stuff on her. And after finishing, she asked me, Sir, one liter in the race too. Because community is no pau seru. My inability to understand the community meant that I was in, unable to even tell her what to do. And if I had spent five more years, which I, much later I realized, if you're walking eight kilometers to get a pot of water, it's a sin to tell them to throw it away in the evening. We tell them, boil it, cool it, sainkala yaru use maadir and the chalbidi. And you know, if you walk six kilometers, then you will not pour it out of the drain. But more importantly, we tell, you know, when we tell this advice, we say, taste it. Nim kannir tarayir vekkadu. It should taste like your tears. How many of you drink your tears? It's a silly question to ask, but that's what we tell people. It should taste like tears. And then you drink it. Now, if a person is having diarrhea and you give that, pretty soon he'll start vomiting also with that. So suddenly it hit me, this is an anthropological community of thousands of years of history. Let me find out what they do for a diarrhea. And what that lady told me is, that is community wisdom. And that is where I, decided, I felt that this wisdom needs to be captured into the state. And how do we put it across? That's my job now. This lady told me, oh, we don't do anything much. We go to the corner shop. Those days, petty shops were there. Everything was not Reliance. So, and <laughs> they would buy. She said, you actually got two bananas for 50 paise those days. Powder the poha, the avlaki, mix it in the banana and we make the child lick it. How many of you have actually, South Kendra it's a very popular dish, avlaki with banana, but here we don't eat it. But you actually try it. Now what is there in our ORS, it's just electrolytes and water. What does this lady tell her children? What is she giving her? 80% water in a banana, sodium, potassium. Banana is a brilliant uh, medicine, it's a laxative when you're constipated. It's also a bowel binder if you have diarrhea. And the child will actually eat it because it's tasty. It's got starch in it. What more do you want? And they have been practicing this for thousands of years. And here I am telling them, you know, all that is rubbish. You should do what WHO says. I think today we are all in a point in time when the Prime Minister gives a call for Jan Bhagidari. My worry is, are we ready to even understand what citizen participation is? having written a book called I the Citizen, and those days being an aggressive act activist, I now feel citizens need capacity to be built, to start engaging, and that is what real democracy is. The state cannot be blamed, cannot be appreciated, till we earn the capacity for it. And I think it's time for us as Indians in the 75th year of our independence to truly be intellectually, emotionally, politically, in every sense independent and participate in building this great country of ours. That is the national resurgence that we all need to have. I'm going to stop here, Yuna. Fantastic. Good place to stop. Thank you very much. I'm actually going to pick up from what you just said about all these petty shops that were not a reliance at every corner. Reliance at every corner and the current state of democracy has turned us all into consumers, digitally and otherwise. So we all you know, we, we follow our passions as far as work goes, when we're bored with work, move on to another job. But when it comes to government, we are very much consumers rather than participants. So how, now with, with your talking and your speech and the, your, your call to engage with government, how do you see that actually turning out? How do you ask them to engage, your audience who's listening to you here? You've lived a life of an activist. Not all of us have lived lives of activists where we've sat and dug at roads to say, this is only Arda Inch. Please, yellow itu missing one and a half inch. So please, well, how would you say? I'll first clarify what is an activist because people shouldn't think activist is somebody who's always fighting. An activist is somebody who's active. All I'm asking is be active citizens. That, that's not too much to ask. Because we get this mental stereotype that an activist is anti-establishment. Far from the truth, we are partners of the state wanting to get the voices of people to be heard. And that is what 
that's what I try to say in Voices from the Grassroots. It's not some rocket science I wrote. It's just community voices which people need to hear and people who have the authority and the mandate and the power to do something about it. So as citizens, if I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you have ever registered a complaint on CP grams? How many of you even know what is CP grams? There's one, one person who knows it. If this is citizen engagement, we have a long way to go. CP Grams is the Government of India's portal for exercising grievances. And I can tell you it actually works because I look at it. I look at data, data, a lot of data. And we, we always have this immediate thought that, yeah, but it's simply a portal set up by the Government of India for every single service given by the government. If you're unhappy with it, bring it to our attention. How will the government even know it's working or not? And I can tell you, plenty of people use it. Five years ago, two lakh people a month were using it. Today, more than 30 lakh people use it. And always the skeptic in an Indian will say, oh, so much must be wrong with government. But what people don't understand is more people get their problems resolved, they have faith in the CP grams and respond back. 98 to 99 percent of issues are resolved, not responded to. We measure, we measure response, we measure resolution, both. We know 100 percent are responded to, but 90 to 99 percent are resolved. How many of us use it? It's a shame, right? Something made available to us, and we always complain, hey, Aru kills Kuala How many of us use the right to information? It's one of the most potent instruments in the hands of a citizen. If I were to ask a question and embarrass more of you here, how many of you act? actually use it for public good. Private things we use, promotion why did the other guy get more salary than me? A lot of applications come. How many of us have used it for public good? No, that is activism, that is active citizenship. So we have to reconstruct this idea of citizenship itself. Citizenship itself by definition is active. You don't even have to be active. That means you're not, you're gone to sleep as citizens. So if state's capacity has to be built, state exists only if citizens exist. And we have to start living the life of a citizen first. Then it gives us the capacity to question the system. So my view is, it's very simple, right? MyGov. How many of us use the MyGov platform to communicate? Look at it today. Today, more than 60 to 70 percent of Padma Shri is given in the last five to six years. If you actually go back, how many of you have gone back to meet the people who have given these Padma Awards, selected by the citizens of this country and informed to the government? There's a strong validation process Enormous Apaji Sahib of Mangalore, I have also sent in a recommendation for him. He deserved it 20 years ago. He's lived his life of building school for in his village, which none of the Karnataka people recognized. But he is the possibly the most deserving Padma. What do we I at least know? There's similarly people in Assam, people in far off places, ordinary citizens. How do we get to know? Because citizens engage. So can we do the simple things? We all think citizen engagement means something complex, go changing a law out there. No, just talking to government is the beginning of the journey. To your corporation, to your local MLA, to your member of parliament. There's so many ways. And today your digital platforms to communicate. Use it. We spend more time on Facebook and WhatsApp looking at all the nonsense that circulates sometimes and believing it, rather than actually getting down to the core of the issue and challenging it and understanding it. So I think activism is just being engaged as a citizen. That's all. Thank you. So I'm going to now, so you've, you've talked a little bit about your life as an activist and uh, you're now currently doing something very different. As opposed to challenging everybody in government, you're working with government. In fact, one would say you're an essential part of government at this point. I know you report into the prime minister directly. So um, I'm going to ask you a question before you then elaborate on exactly what you're doing. I was going to say uh, on the other side, you know, you're working, you're a member of the Capacity Building Commission. You've been on it since, I think, April 2021. And uh, the behest is the, the partnership side from the government side, how to engage with citizens, how to improve the work that's being done, the capacity that the state has to engage and deliver services. From your side, um, what's the macro view? And then I'll ask you the micro question. See, I think uh, most of us are so busy with our lives and we are so busy looking at what is going wrong that we hardly get time to see what, what are corrective things happening, what things are going right. And I can only talk about uh, what I am absolutely confident of talking. Uh, we must understand, like I said, 
90s, the ability to facilitate was a skill set. Today, the ability to build partnerships and collaborate is a skill set. People are not ready because we always live in a country where the state is the my bap sarkar. They know everything, they do everything for us. Suddenly we say Jan Bagidari participate. I don't, I can't even understand it. And I don't remember the exact paper or the time. Uh, maybe 20 years ago, Harvard did, did a study of how do citizens see their governments. Uh, I forget the author, but I know it was published from Harvard. And uh, each one, had, they went to every country and said, what do you think? Do you need a government? Is one of the questions. Every country, like in US, most of them said, what do you mean we need a government? There's the problem. We don't need government, right? Scandinavian countries said, you know, they were 70, 80 percent of your life is run by the government for you. They were happy with government. 46 percent or something of the UK people said we need government. But in India, you can find out at least 90 percent of people will criticize government. But 82 percent of the people said, what the hell do you mean we don't need government? At least we need somebody to bash up, no? So we are a very contradictory system of, uh, you know, in our thinking. We need somebody, but at the same time, we don't want that somebody. We think they're too much into our lives. We think that we don't want them in our lives. This less government, more governance is actually not something more than a slogan. But it takes a lot of capacity of the state to let go. How many of us are even capable of letting go? We, I start a small organization to step aside and let go. It's a struggle for me. Right? And for a state which is thousands of years old, suddenly to say, you know what, let the citizens run it. We don't have capacity, that's different. But it's difficult, it's a process. So today, partnership is a deep change at a multiple levels, the systemic level, psychological level. So Mission Karma Yogi is the mission that the Honorable Prime Minister conceived, and he felt that we don't, have, we don't even have a bureaucracy which is ready to solve today's problems. So we need a bureaucracy to solve tomorrow's problems. And COVID, I think COVID is a sort of an excellent opportunity. I don't, I'm not even belittling the tragedy of COVID. But I can tell you, and I can tell you again, I have data, I can tell you, despite all the criticisms we make, we are one of the best managed public health responses in the world. And it is, everybody came together. It is not the state, it was state initiated, but everybody participated, corporate sector participated, private citizens participated. When the migrant crisis happened, people fed people on the streets, they had nothing to do with it. NGOs came together, every single sector. So it's possibly, today, sectoral margins are blurring. We need to really understand that this is a great opportunity for us to appreciate that we can solve a problem with the country if we get together. And that is a, that is a beginning. And then the Prime Minister said, if this can happen once, can we make it an institutional mechanism? Can we get people to co-think the problem and see if they can co-generate a solution? Now that's a visionary thinking, but the system is not ready. Let's be practical also. So he said to make the system ready, we need to build capacities. And so the Capacity Building Commission is the heart and soul of Mission Karma Yogi, where the Seva Bhav has to come back, the Karma Yogi concept has to come back. So he says, how do you convert people from thinking that they are karmachari Make them become a karma yogi, salaried employee to serving the nation. Now that's a huge ask. Second, he says, people, when a citizen comes into the office, government office, he's always told rules. This can't happen, this can't be done. Now all of us are frustrated. I've been frustrated tremendously. So he says, all that is nice, what's the solution? So from a rule-based approach to get, get people to understand, there's a role-based approach. And how do you move towards it? Which means they need to know where they are, what the capacities are. So you will be fascinated, and some of you, may, these are private sector words, and many of you may not even understand this is happening. At least in Government of India, we're making it happen. We are running a HR audit today of the entire government. We have 20 million employees of the Government of India, railways, paramilitary forces, et cetera. We don't even know these numbers. We don't think of government. You know, It's a faceless entity for us. And we have another 20 million in all the states put together. That means four crore Indians are in the system. And till I join the government, I'm not having the mandate just to speak without data, till I joined the government was extremely critical and had stereotyped the government as mediocre, inefficient, and expensive. Today I can assure you and tell you that we are one of the cheapest governance per capita expenditure in the world. <laughs> and and it's, are we efficient? No. We have to make it efficient. That doesn't mean just because we're cheap we shouldn't be efficient. We still might be mediocre in several things. But there has a change happening, yes, last year, and the world is changing, isn't today? Technology, information communication is so much that every single Indian has become so aspirational. I see a YouTube video in a village, and I know my tribals tell me, the aspirations have changed. 30 years ago, my tribal's aspiration was, Sir, I need to Today, he says, I want a smartphone with a motorcycle hero, and I'll also tell you which model he wants. And that's not wrong. 
I'm not even saying anything. That's the way aspirations have grown. So we need to understand, is the system capable of responding to the aspirations? And because of technology. Second, the technology has also made most of us engage, but not in constructive manners. We are wasting our time in distractions today. Uh, whatever, whichever side of the fence we are in, I have no problem saying this. But can we look at it and say, we all have one national mandate to build. So he said, how do you get this thinking? How do you build competence? So we measure every single government employee today has to have a competency assessed. His roles are mapped. We are mapping this. We have already done so much. There are 60 plus ministries of government of India, 93 departments, 2,600 attached institutions across India, 3.1 million employees in the first level, 100,000 people are Group A officers, but the crux of India is Group B and C. And today, we are, somebody is paying attention to them. And we are now mapping each employee, asking what is his job in the system. If he doesn't have a job, can we move him somewhere else? If he's not able to deliver, can we get four more people into it? We all celebrate when Air India gets sold. But how many of us have asked, what happens to a set of people who ran Air India in government? In the government, not in Air India. There's a ministry. What happens to the skill set? Today, we are privatizing airports. How does the government are able to manage Airport Authority of India, public airports, and also take their hands off private airports? Have you ever thought about it? Now, we are now asking all these questions. So we measure competency at three levels. What is a behavioral competency? The mindset. How ready are you to serve government? What is public service for you? We measure functional competencies. I'll give you an example. If you're a joint secretary in government, you come from a family of bureaucrats, now things are going to be different. You ask, if you're a joint secretary in government of India's agriculture ministry, we ask you, as a joint secretary, what is your damn role? Do you know how to write a cabinet note? Do you know how to write a policy brief? Every joint secretary in government has to know basic things. It's very easy to determine. We have determined it. We actually do a proctored assessment of his capacity. If he doesn't have it, we build it. We don't say that you're useless. We say, we'll give you three months' time. You better get it. And we're mapping. Every data comes to me so I can say this. Third competence is domain competency. Today morning, he is in agriculture. He crosses the chief minister. Tomorrow morning, he is in some wasteland development. And he's expected to know all about wasteland development. Now we are saying you cannot report into your new job if your domain competency for that is not built in you. So we measure, we map, and we build capacity. So 800 training institutions of the government of India, including your labasnas, your uh, police academies, your forest academies, we are watching it. We are helping them, building their capacity to build capacity. So both supply side and demand side, we're working. On the demand side, we go to a ministry. Again, as citizens, you should all be happy. We are actually de developing capacity building plans where every single person's capacity is going to be built to look at five or six things. We align it to five or six things. First thing is, how, how are you contributing to build a $5 trillion inclusive economy, not just an economy? And that is, without citizens, you can't build. Sorry, please say that again. How, are you, how is this ministry contributing to build a $5 trillion inclusive economy? Trillion. Second, Atmanir Bharate can't be a slogan, demonstrate self reliance in a ministry. What are you doing? Atmanir Bharate in thinking and governance. Third, how citizen-centric are you? <coughs> And that's where my job comes into the system. Ease of living. All this, we have not cracked the code. I know, let's not, and we Indians are very, all the time skeptical. I think give us time. It will happen. Fourth thing we ask is, how are you deploying emerging technology? Everybody is fascinated by talking, oh, AI, ML, blockchain. I can tell you 80% in this room would have heard those words, but you want to know what the hell it is. That's exactly how government of India operates. So everybody talks, oh, Nam official blockchain, what would now, what it is, how do you use it? So we develop emerging technology roadmaps. And I can tell you, just by making sure direct bank transfer operates on a massive set of back-end algorithmic operations, 1.9 lakh crore rupees was saved last year. And as a person who served five years in the Lokayukta, I know how it leaks. And if that leakage can be plugged to even... For me, the silver lining should be celebrated. The dark clouds are still there. But every Indian should look at how do I expand the silver lining to help the dark clouds disappear. So today, capacities are getting built. We are running engagement surveys. We are running learning and development surveys. We are also quiet organization, because we think that any noise will only distract. So we are not interested in that. And so many interventions today, quietly is building capacity. It's creating a quiet revolution. The impact of it will be seen three to five years later, not right away. But let's all be patient. But that doesn't mean we can take our hands off the as a citizen, we can't take our hands off the system. So the scope of what you talked about is actually very tremendous. And I think we haven't even begun to deconstruct it. But, you know, at a, at a, um, at a very concrete, granular level, right, 
these are all big words, you know, uh, policy. And I, I know people in government create reams and reams of policy, and then they'll write off an order and leave Hogmari, and then, you know, it'll go down the chain, and someone will understand it completely differently. And by the time it gets to the guy who's executing, it may or may not be implemented in the spirit in which it was intended, right? So, considering what you've talked about, which is actually very revolutionary, you're talking about completely changing the way government um, functions, the way government operates, if you're talking about needing to have capacity before you get posted into some area that you know, you've never had the background to actually deal with, rather than general managerial skills. Uh, there's also a piece around passion. You, know, you might be very passionate about what you're doing, that, that's your purpose to go to work every day and be, you know, that's, that's where the uh, karma part of the yogi comes in, but then you go to some, some place you don't really care about, and then you know, it's, it's clocking in that nine to five. So keeping all of this in mind, and uh, conscious of time, um, can you give me one concrete example of, uh, of, of what this could look like? And then I'm going to grill you more so you're not off the hook because I know you have an example in your pocket. So I ahead. have several examples. I know the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. Um, I'll, I'll just take 30 seconds to set why we thought about this example. For, I think our mandate is very simple. We look, we look at what is called the three W's. We look at what is the future of work. The future of work, how does it mean for each one of us in the post-COVID world? So how does the future of public administration and governance look like? Second is we say, what are the, what are the workplace going to look like? Today it's a gig economy. We have Ubers and Olas and every Swiggies and Zomatos. Because surprisingly, you'll all be surprised, we realized, we learned uh, last year that DOPT, the amount of uh, work they could manage to do despite losing some senior offices to COVID in Delhi, they achieved more by working from home than coming to office. And in government, they suddenly woke up and said, we have been doing a lot without even coming to office, which meant a lot of procedures could be re-looked at. So workplace redefinition we are doing. And why shouldn't a government office be good looking? Why shouldn't a parliament be the best? So we are looking at all, all the workplace. Last is the worker, because we always blame the worker. So I think it's a combination. And at the worker level, we look at three things. We look at, does he have the motives to work? No, are we giving him enough motivation to work? I can tell you, I've met some of the finest, brilliant brains from IITs and IIMs of this country who chose not to go to private sector and came for public service. And we should celebrate it. Their batchmates are earning crores today and they can make easy comparisons. And we say, oh my God, this guy's got a servant, he's got a car. No. And we give him a salary, which is a joke. But the point I'm trying to make is, does he have the motives despite that to work? Second, does he have the means to work? Have we trained him? And third, we are asking is, are we giving him the right opportunities? And we're doing that now. So I'll give an example of this micro level thing. When we looked around, we looked at the CP Gram site, and we found maximum complaints came about the railways. And we're fascinated. 30 lakh complaints a month and maximum from the Indian railways. And look, government of India does hardly anything citizen-centric. Reality is most of the action is in the states. If the states and the corporations and the urban local bodies and panchayats do well, country improves. But then everybody blames the government of India for everything. So we said, let's look at it and say, what does citizen centricity mean? The, then we took the largest footprint in India, either the Indian postal system or the Indian railways. So we took the Indian railways and said, how citizen centric it could be. So we ran very quietly in January last year, we ran a perception survey across India. What do citizens think of the railways? We started that because we looked at CP grams and we realized a lot of complaints are about railways and we saw most of the complaints were on refunds. 80% of the complaints were, I'm not getting my refund from IRCTC, which means a digitally knowledgeable person who's operating IRCTC is the only one who's complaining also. But they are not the only ones traveling, and the maximum ticket sold is not online, unlike what people think. It's on the counter, across the counter. So we found out that if we can look at the people who are buying tickets at the counter and go survey them, what are their problems? That's how we started this, and we realized that the perception of railways was not as you all know, what all we have. You know, the moment I say TTE, I'm sure most of you, if I ask you, what do you think about a TTE, we always think, that's how we think of it. Let's all be practical. All of us are trained and we have experienced it. Some of us would have such experiences. We'll never think of the young, brilliant minds who go in the youngsters who go in today's train, that they are not that category anymore. But that's how we pop. So we mapped out, amongst all the millions of employees in railways, there are only 150,000 Indian railway employees who are actually citizen-facing. And only four categories of employees, the ticketing clerk, the booking parcel clerk, the uh, station master in small stations, and the TTE. 
and 80, every day they have an average of 80 times, 80 skirmishes with citizens. On average, I'm just generalizing here. Just imagine 80 times a day I come and fight with you and you expect him to be very friendly and citizen nice. Huh? Let me, I was remembering my own life and I was actually sitting in a clinic in Brahmagiri. 80 to 100 patients would come day for us because there was never a doctor there before. 3.34 in the afternoon, I'd be hungry and the tribals would come back and say, uh, I would have told him how to take medicines. He would have gone to the prescription for a pharmacy, pharmacy also. The pharmacist would have told him, he'll go outside, come after half an hour and say, Sir, if he said, he said, he said, he said, he said, he said, he and you are the 30th patient coming in asking the same question. I would ask, All of us lose our patience. And these people, we never, talk, we never understand they're human beings. So we mapped it. Then we did a cognitive ethnography. Why do they fight? Why do these 80 fights happen? They're only for 12 reasons. So we and designed a training program to build the capacity of the... We don't have control over citizens. That's an ecosystem we don't control. We control the government. So we said, can we map this and build the capacity of the railway officers in these four people alone and then see what will happen. So we have done it, 150,000 people with translational loss of virtually zero across India have been trained today in being citizen friendly and seeing joy and affirmation in being citizen friendly. Then we went, next year we're going to go back and do the same citizen centric survey, perception survey and say, is there a delta? It's been very scientifically designed and delivered. But when I did this, I was watching. I was watching a parcel clerk. I myself went in the ethnography team. The fellow was uh, talking to him and he said, uh, 20 rupiah, or 20 kilo. And this citizen says, Kya 20 kilo kyon bol rahe ho? 15 kilo likh lo na? And he said, Aisa nahi hoga, 5 kilo to jada hai. He said, Nahi, mai to de, de dunga. And he gives 50 rupee note. And I'm watching the whole thing. Now we criticize the clerk and say, What the hell, that fellow is taking a bribe. But how many of us standing around there catch the citizen and say, why are you not paying the five kilos of money also? None of us will talk. None of the citizens are talking. I was watching. Everybody is doing it. So I realized it is not about just building unidimensional capacity, we'll fail. Unless we as citizens say, I'm going to do my job as a citizen, which means all this also. I pay my taxes on time. I don't violate any laws. I don't build that extra one foot offset. I stop at a signal light. I do my job as a citizen, gives me the moral right to engage Question, hold people accountable. And so to me, it's a two-way street. And this railways, then we, we are doing with dark savaks, two and a half lakh people. We are doing with, but the entire UT police has been trained. We're telling policemen, you are not here to maintain law and order. We are telling them you are custodians of society. And look at the joy with which they're working. Today we're training Delhi police. Delhi police, today Delhi citizens during COVID suddenly call them Dilki police. The citizens call them, so we call the same thing. We're calling Dilki police and we're saying, we're training them. We are going to start training uh, lakhs of people in this. The footprint is going to be global. But they are all government of India people we can reach. Now, our mandate is expanded to the entire country. So states reach out to us, and we are a very clear collaborative commission. We say any state wanting us, if you reach out to us, we'll come and support you. So some states have reached out. Assam, Maharashtra, Karnataka, I'm meeting the chief secretary tomorrow. So as states reach out to us, we're doing, we're going to do Karmayogi Shikshak in Karnataka. Two lakh people are going to be trained to say, how do I serve in the spirit of building a community, which is not just about teaching, but about being a partner between the system and the state and the citizens. So a lot of exciting things happening. Okay, so I'm not asking for the 2047 vision here, because I already know the 27, 2047 vision is one that probably is too far away for us to touch, feel, understand, and it'll just be a whole bunch of words that really make no sense. Um, but what is the vision a year from now? Which is, you know, it's, it's a very short term. It, it, you know, you're talking about going back and like doing your satisfaction survey in a year. It's, but, but also looking at the reach that you've already had. What, what is, I'll break it down into three parts. What's your hope, what's your desire, and what's your expectation? My hope is, you know, whatever we are doing, actually start showing results. My expectation is also that. My desire is this commission, see any commission, uh, we are a permanent independent executive commission. Like any commission which is set up on an executive order has got a life related to the cabinet and the prime minister. Tomorrow, like any government things like with the, uh, the planning commission is all some government comes and says the capacity building commission is no use to me. Well, then I hope that does not happen in this country because capacity building is a lifelong exercise. I remember uh, in our, one of our mandates in the, in the government order says 
enable lifelong learning in every indian citizen every indian employee government of india or state employee uh, ramkrishna paramahamsa said this he said as long as i live so long do i learn and i think if we can embed this that's my desire if we can embed this feeling in every indian today we are creating the world's largest learning management system called i got integrated government online training which does all this it maps it out it measures competency opens up 60000 courses you can do anytime anywhere any instrument learning these are things which have never been heard of so enormous use of digital technology we are craving 3 minute videos nowhere in the world it has been attempted we are the first commission ever set up by any government and we should be proud of it <laughs> the united states tried something like this and i'm saying this because when bill clinton tried it he appointed al gore his own vice president as the chair of that unit he called it reinvention of government today we have papers saying why it failed why it didn't take off then in us government brought in a law which said gpra you know government performance results act it still i have friends in the us government they tell me how it is but we are we are we are actually looking at it we'll be we are preparing a report called performance of health of civil services we are mapping it it will go to parliament so suddenly capacity building responsiveness system change is part of the narrative ministry the law and justice ministry the legislative department all of that we are looking at but at this point of time our mandate doesn't extend to the other two arms of government and i see the question there is a importance in the question itself there is evidence that it's important uh, i'm i'm sure you have traveled in uh, bhutan uh, there they measure uh, the happiness quotient do you have anything like that uh, in your concept we are, we are developing two things uh, i think uh, uh two two things we are developing one is uh, we are looking at citizen trust index because we for too long we have never we have never asked ourselves do citizens trust their government we always say uh, transparency and all that i think that's all rubbish end of the day do we trust the system so we are developing a citizen trust index i have not at fine tuned it once we do it that will be a measurement tool of governance so i will off the record i can share with you what i have written on performance of state and we are actually measuring it it's not the data systems don't exist now so we are embedding what is called a capacity building unit in every ministry who collects this data and authoritatively and authentically next year and it can be subject to global scientific scrutiny we will be publishing this information and saying how what the performance looks like how healthy it is but that will take a year or two because data is not there for me to make comments on but as of today we are trying to develop a citizen trust index I think I would have questions about how do you measure the unmeasurables, but I will not ask you that question here. There's a question there in the corner. Please. Good evening. I'm yeah. an agriculturist from Mangalore, and uh, during my college days, I had a learning curve, which was a farm-to-fork model app, which failed. But where do you see the future? Where o on ONDC, even a small cottage industry or a uh, agriculture or produce value-added products, what CFTR or CSI CSIR is developing? How do you? a brand a small farmer and seamlessly through technology uh, enter the gate into ondc so that is my question uh, right now as all i don't know if you know what ondc is that is referring to uh, it, it it's a business uh, portal which is being developed by the government of india like upi uh, like in, why why are we going to amazon and flipkart of the world why not we just put together a portal of ours where everybody can register and sell and that actually makes it can be customer to customer also so farmers can go and register it will be the world's largest business portal anywhere conceived and uh, i think a lot of technologies are working on it uh, my guess is yeah can there be one door where we know that okay this is by the government to enter ondc because we have a lot of companies that saying we are going to do, like it can be any app but then from the government representation as you know Come uh, in. Let go. me. Let okay. Me okay. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to stop there because we have two minutes and I have one more question. So no further clarification. I'll answer you offline. You will answer. Okay. Thank you very much. One question there. I know you guys are not Good going in. to like me very much at the end Good of this. In. I'm sorry. <laughs> I promise I'm a very I nice person. I have an easier solution. Umna, you ignore them. You'll be likable. Ah, uh, none question. I cannot tell Kerala. Cannot tell Kerala. Ah, none. Ah, none. Actually, my sorrows are doing like artists, Anna. None. Actually, ah, you know, one do I do? ಬಿಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಟ್ರೇಡ್ ಲೈಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಮಾಡ್ಸಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋದಾಗ ನಾನೇನು ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಫಸ್ಟು ಆನ್ಲೈನಲ್ಲಿ ಅಪ್ಲೈ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಎರಡು ಸಲ ಅಪ್ಲೈ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಎರಡು ಸಲ ರಿಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಯಿತು ಮೂರನೇ ಸಲ ಹೋದರೆ ಸರ್ ನೀವು ಆನ್ಲೈನಲ್ಲಿ ಅಪ್ಲೈ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರೆ ಸಾಕಾಗಲ್ಲ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಬಂದ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಎಲ್ಲ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ವಾಪಸ್ ಕೊಡಬೇಕು ನಮ್ಮ ಕೈಲಿ ಸೇಮ್ ಇದೇ ನಾನು ಸೆಂಟ್ರಲ್ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ದು ಡಿ ಸಿ ಎಚ್ ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ಐ ಡಿ ಕಾರ್ಡ್ಗೆ ಅಪ್ಲೈ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಮೂರು ಸಲ ಅಪ್ಲೈ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಮೂರು ಸಲನೂ ಏನೂ ಆನ್ಸರೇ ಬರಲಿಲ್ಲ ನಾನು ಮೇಲೆಲ್ಲ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಎಲ್ಲ ಫಾಲೋಅಪ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಏನೂ ಬರಲಿಲ್ಲ ಆಮೇಲೆ ಹೋಗಿ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಆಫ್ಲೈನಲ್ಲಿ ಕೊಟ್ಟಾಗ ಐ ಡಿ ಕಾರ್ಡ್ನ ಇದು ಏನು ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟೆ ಆಮೇಲೆ ಅದು ಅಪ್ರೂವ್ ಆಯಿತು ಇವ
ನಾನು ಆರ್ ಟಿ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಇವಾಗ ಈ ಟೈಮ್ ಕೋವಿಡ್ ಬಂದಾಗ ಆರ್ಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ಗೆ ಒಂದು ರೂಪಾಯಿ ಯಾರು ಬರಲಿಲ್ಲ ಆವಾಗ ಏನು ಮಾಡ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಎಲ್ಲ ಆರ್ಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ಗಳು ಗಾರೆ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತವ್ರ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಅಪ್ಲೈ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರು ಆವಾಗ ಒಂದೂವರೆ ಸಾವಿರ ರೂಪಾಯಿ ಒಂದೂವರೆ ಸಾವಿರ ರೂಪಾಯಿಗೆ ಆರ್ಟಿಸನ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಮೈಸೂರು ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನಿಂದನೇ ಇಷ್ಟೊಂದು ಫೇಮಸ್ ಆಗಿರೋದು ಬಟ್ ಆರ್ಟಿಸನ್ಗೆ ಒಂದೂವರೆ ಸಾವಿರ ರೂಪಾಯಿಗೋಸ್ಕರ ಆರ್ಟಿಸನ್ ಕೆಲಸ ಬಿಟ್ಟು ನಾನು ಗಾರೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಮಾಡ್ತೇನೆ ಸಾರಿ ಹ್ಞೂ ಸೊ ಇದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆ ಏನು ಅಂತ ಹುಡುಕ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಇನ್ನೂ ನೀವು ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇದು ಸಿ ನಾವು ಯಾವುದೇ ಯಾವುದೇ ಕೆಲಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಗಳು ತೊಗೊಂಡ್ರೂ ಕೂಡ ಮೆಚುರೇಷನ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಒಂದು ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಐ ಆಮ್ ನಾಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟಿಫೈಯಿಂಗ್ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ನಿಮಗೆ ಎರಡನೇ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಕಾಲ ಉತ್ತರ ಕೊಡ್ತೀನಿ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಈ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ಗೆ ಥರನೇ ಈಗ ಎಷ್ಟು ಜನ ಫೇ ಇದರಲ್ಲಿ ಇನ್ಕಮ್ ಟ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ರಿಟರ್ನ್ಸ್ ಫೈಲ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೀರಿ ಆಗಲೇ ಈ ವರ್ಷದ್ದು ಲೇಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ಎಷ್ಟು ಜನಕ್ಕೆ ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ರೀಫಂಡ್ ಬರಬೇಕಾಗಿತ್ತು ಎಷ್ಟು ಜನಕ್ಕೆ ರೀಫಂಡ್ ಆಗಲೇ ಬಂದಾಯಿತು ಹಾಂ ಸೊ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಅ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಮುಂಚೆ ಆರು ತಿಂಗಳಾದರೂ ಬರ್ತಿರಲಿಲ್ಲ ಸೊ ದೇರ್ಸ್ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಕ್ಸಸ್ ಸ್ಟೋರೀಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಇದಕ್ಕೆ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಥರ ಉತ್ತರ ಕೊಡ್ತೀನಿ ಜಿ ಎಸ್ ಟಿ ರಿಜಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಎಷ್ಟು ಜನ ಪ್ರಯತ್ನ ಪಟ್ಟಿದ್ದೀರಿ ಜಿ ಎಸ್ ಟಿಲಿ ಅನ್ಫಾರ್ಚುನೇಟ್ಲಿ ಏನಾಗುತ್ತೆ ರ್ಯಾಂಡಮ್ ಆಗಿ ದ ಫೈಲ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಸೆಂಟ್ ಟು ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಆರ್ ಟು ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಷನಲ್ಲಿ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಅ ಪೊಲಿಟಿಕಲ್ ಎಕಾನಮಿ ಡೆಮೊಕ್ರಟೈಸೇಷನ್ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾಗೆ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಫೈಲ್ ಹೋದರೆ ನನಗೆ ತುಂಬ ಜನ ಅಪ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ಸ್ ಬಂದು ಮಾತಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ಏನಂದರೆ ಯಾಕೆ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಟೇ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಯಾಕೆ ಹೋಗಬೇಕು ಎಲ್ಲ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಕಳಿಸ್ಬಿಡಿ ಅಂತ ಆವಾಗ ಹಂಗೆ ಮಾತಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಎಲ್ಲ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾಗೆ ಹಾಕ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಜಿ ಎಸ್ ಟಿ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲಲ್ಲಿ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರೆ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಸೆಂಟ್ರ್ ರಿಲೇಷನ್ಶಿಪ್ಸ್ ಅಂದ್ಬಿಡ್ತೀವಿ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾಗೆ ಹೋದರೆ ಮೂರು ಗಂಟೆಲಿ ಪ್ರೊಸೆಸ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಆಗಿದೆ ಅಲ್ವಾ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕಾಗೆ ಹೋದರೆ ನೀವು ಹತ್ತು ಮೂವತ್ತು ಸಲ ಆಫೀಸ್ಗೆ ಹೋಗಬೇಕು ಅವ್ನು ಪ್ರಿಂಟ್ ಔಟ್ ಕೊಡಬೇಕು ಸೊ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಯು ಮಸ್ ಆಸ್ ದ ಲೋಕಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಂಗೇಜ್ ಸೊ ಮೈ ವ್ಯೂ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಶುಡ್ ಗೋ ಟು ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಮೇಕ್ ದ ಲೋಕಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ರೆಸ್ಪಾಂಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಎಂಗೇಜ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಈಸಿ ಬಟ್ ಚೇಂಜ್ ಇಸ್ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಎಪ್ಪತ್ತೈದು ವರ್ಷದ ಇತಿಹಾಸ ಇದೆ ನಮಗೆ ಸಂದರ್ಭಕ್ಕೆ ತಕ್ಕಂತೆ ಬದಲಾವಣೆ ಹಾಕ್ಕೊಂಬಂದಿದ್ದೀವಿ ಈಗ ಸಮಯ ಸಿಕ್ಕಿದೆ ಸಕ್ರಿಯವಾಗಿ ಸಂಪೂರ್ಣವಾಗಿ ಬೇಸರ ಆಗತ್ತೆ ನನಗೇ ಬೇಸರ ಆಗತ್ತೆ ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆ ಒಳಗೆ ಏನಪ್ಪ ಇಷ್ಟು ಸಲ ಹೇಳ್ತೀನಿ ಅಧಿಕಾರಿಗಳು ಅರ್ಥ ಆಗಲ್ಲ ಅಂತ ದ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಟಿವಿಸ್ ಇನ್ ಮೀ ನೆವರ್ ಡೈಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಐ ಟೆಲ್ ಮೈ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಬಟ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಚೇಂಜಿಂಗ್ ವಿ ನೀಡ್ ಪೇಷನ್ಸ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಚೇಂಜಿಂಗ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಗೋ ದ ಪ್ರೆಷರ್ ಲೆಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಅ ಎಟರ್ನಲ್ ಆಪ್ಟಿಮಿಸ್ಟ್ ಐ ನೋ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಆಸ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಮಚ್ ಬಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಹೆಲ್ಸ್ ಕೆನ್ ವಿ ಸಿಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ ಬಿ ಇಫ್ ವಿ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಡೆಸ್ಪಾಂಡೆಂಟ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಎಂಡ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ರೂಯಿಂಗ್ so we have to say that despite our personal experiences the generic silver lining is there and we keep working on it i'm going to do i'm going to do a small personal plug i run an art trust called art mantram trust and we we try to do a lot of support but obviously small organizations can do small things it's no no comparison to the government but we're setting up a center of excellence opening in bandipur thursday soft launch please dev to bani or meet me afterwards and i'll see if we can do anything to support but uh, that's just from my side but i think this comes to the point that you were talking about on the covid where which is a good example did you talk about it here did we talk about it earlier we talked about it here now i'm so confused we've had so many conversations but i think that this becomes a example of the fact that everybody needs to engage with the
right? And I, in, our, in my own ethnographic observation, I found this young lady, a 26-year-old TTE, when standing in the train because she gave up her birth to a sick woman who had no reservation in t that, uh, but she found out and she made her sleep there. And I realized whoever went and thanked her, how many even people of us know of this? And we will always say, Patrupai, Tokondi Rupika, Kay Kotru Bartna. Right? That's how we think. Then we have in this app, we have said, Karma Yogi moments. So we tell our railway officers, forget it. If government of the citizens of India don't say thank you, let's build a community of practitioners, TTEs, booking clerks, who will celebrate the goodness you do to society. Forget society saying thank you. We'll say thank you to each other. Because that's the first step. And today on the Karma Yogi app, thousands of uh, uploads happen every day because 150,000 people, they're celebrating goodness. We built a community of good people, positive thoughts are spreading, and they say, and they look at their colleagues and say, oh my God, this guy did this, they learn from it. And let's all make a simple promise to ourselves. Public service is thankless service. We criticize, we complain, we are rightfully so because we are citizens. But when something good happens, have the courage to thank people. Celebrate it. When, when you travel safely in a bus, when you get down at the bus stop, go to the driver and say, thank you for bringing me safely. If that, uh, I, a day before yesterday, I was traveling in a flight from Guwahati to my Delhi, and I found a passenger who's carrying a bag which is completely illegal to be brought as cabin baggage. So the, very politely, the crew uh, asked the thing to get into that. And they promised him it will come out first. The way he fought. And these two young women, the stewards, the way they attended to her was such a pleasure to watch. And I realized the whole flight, that one unruly passenger, the way they managed him, nobody went to those two young women and said, thank you for making the rest of us passengers travel happily. And I realized that when I got down, I spoke to these two women and said, I wouldn't want my daughter to do your jobs, but I think as daughters of India, you need a... ...meeting us and uh, allowing us to have this fantastic discussion. As I'm sure you're all aware, we could keep talking. There's, there's a lot being done, there's a lot to be done, and there's a lot, of, lot to challenge. Um, thank you for sitting patiently. Thank you for attending. It's the last session. Uh, all my gratitude to you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Balu, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me over. It's a pleasure to come to myself.